Okay, good evening, everybody. Look at the clock. It is 6.30. This has never happened, I think, in the history of a book event. But we'll have stragglers coming in. No big deal. I'll bring in more chairs quietly if we need to. Um, thanks for coming out on a snowy night. Uh, and of course, the bookstore would love to uh, thank Wilkinson Public Library, our five-star library. Um, we collaborate on a lot of events because of this room and this technology, which just doesn't fit in the bookstore. <laughs> um, and it's great coming over here and being in another building of books. Um, I also want to thank the press that we got for John's uh, appearance tonight. Um, that was wonderful. Um, and also to thank Mr. Wright for his arduous journey from Silverton. Um, and I would like to also mentioned that your accessories, if you can put them on vibrate or quiet, unless of course you're search and rescue or something like that, um, that would be helpful. I should probably do the same. There we go. Um, quickly, we do have some events coming up in the next month or so on February 21st, the Thursday, at the Nugget, Kenny Ozabel, founder of the Bioneers, uh, will be speaking at the Nugget and then we'll probably hold a book signing for Dreaming the Future. Um, his current book at the bookstore because they need to show a movie so we'll all just walk across the street to the bookstore that's on the 21st March 4th we have three female well three Western women writers called uh, women writing the West um, that will be speaking um, from Tory House Press from in Utah a great publishing house that publishes phenomenal fiction and environmental and activism um, titles and we really are enjoying our relationship with them so we'll have three gals at Arroyo Wine Bar um, for Monday, March 4th. And then March 26th, we'll be back in this room with Jim Hale. His son lives down the valley, and he has been an Alaskan explorer and adventurer for his whole life. And he was also, I believe, um, involved with the 19, in the 1980s, the hang gliding expedition off of Denali, all kinds of great stuff. Great book, um, and that's on the 26th. Um, after John speaks, we'll do a little signing back there at the table, so please come on back. Um, and then right now I am going to read a condensed version of the foreword to the book. Um, it is in first person, so when I say we, don't think it's me. I'm just playing the part. Blazing Ice, pioneering the 21st century's road to the South Pole. The United States established a strategic presence at the geographic South Pole in 1956. Since that time, we have supplied South Pole from our logistics hub at McMurdo Station on the coast of Antarctica entirely by airlift. Just over 100 years ago, no one had even seen the South Pole. These days, World War II and Cold War interests in the unknown continent have quieted. The National Science Foundation now runs the entire scope of American interests in Antarctica through the United States and Arctic program. USAP or USAP? USAP. USAP. <laughs> Glimpsing the first 30 seconds after the Big Bang, measuring the annual dilation of the ozone hole, monitoring the front lines of global warming. This is world-class science we do down there. It requires extraordinary logistical support. Mm -hmm. At the turn of this present century, the United States was in the middle of building its third research center, uh, station at South Pole, about a 10-year construction project. The building material and supply demand was such that an inordinate number of LC-130 Hercules cargo flights, otherwise available for supporting deep field science projects, were diverted to support the massive construction project. Remote field science, the great strength of the USAP, was dying. The South Pole Traverse Proof of Concept Project asked, could we, the United States Antarctic Program, find a cargo haul route over the surface, prove it safe, show it could be done over and over again? We hoped to relieve South Pole of its reliance on LC-130 cargo flights. In an ironic twist, modern technology perfected in the 1990s and available in 2000 enabled this more primitive means of delivering supplies to South Pole. We had GPS for navigation, ground penetrating radar for finding deadly hidden crevasses, iridium phones with data links for email, satellite imagery. None of these were available when the United States Antarctic programs dropped a bulldozer in a crevasse not far from McMurdo in 1990. The time was right for us now. It took four years to prove the route or root. I'm a climber, I say route. Did you say root? As you wish. Okay. John Wright led that project, and he's here to tell you about the South Pole Traverse. Ladies and gentlemen, John Wright. What a pleasure to be, what a pleasure to be here among you all and tell you this really great, great story. You know, whenever you go to a new place of work, 
you have to learn a new jargon. Most of us don't use the word traverse in daily discourse. So, but that's what the word we use in, in Antarctica. So I want to give you a, f a little bit of a flavor for what I mean by traverse. Okay, arrows. There. Oh, <laughs> wrong desert. Um, a caravan of camels. A convoy of ships at sea. And are you ready? That's the one I got from you. Familiar to all you Telluridians, or how do you wow, call yourselves? Yep, yeah. yeah, that's right down here on Main Street at Telluride. Uh, what do they all have in common? You're all trying to get some massive cargo from some place where it is to some place where it's needed. So caravan, convoy, a mule train, in Antarctica, a heavy traverse. This is what a traverse looks like in Antarctica. So when I use the word traverse, I'm using it kind of as a noun, and I'm using it kind of as a verb, but it's just a traverse, that's what you say, so get used to it. Okay, um, this, I promise, is the only text slide you're going to see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is a heavy cargo traverse. What are the features of, of it? It has to carry everything it needs it has to carry something that somebody else needs at a distant point. It needs to travel on a repeatable route and maintain the surface for maximum mobility. Now there's a couple of red words there that stick out like a sore thumb. Repeatable route, maintained surface. Mm. Most folks call that a road. <laughs> we were not allowed to call it a road. So in this age of the tyranny of words, uh, use of the word road conjured up images like interstate highways and high volumes of traffic and just any Tom, Dick, and Harry coming down there and driving the road. Uh, so we had to call it a repeatable route with a maintained surface. So, and why were we doing this? Uh, Diva hinted on this when she read segments of the, uh, of the condensed forward. Uh, this is roughly around the turn of the present century. Every year in Antarctica, there's about 450 LC-130 cargo flights allotted for the doing of business in Antarctica for intracontinental support, whether it be South Pole Station or deep field science support. There's about 450 such flights. In 1998-99, 182 of that 450 went to support deep field science. The balance to support the new station construction at South Pole. In 2001, 2002, holy cow, only 62 flights available for the doing of deep field science and the rest of that 450 all just slamming South Pole with material and construction for the new station. So under those circumstances, uh, we found support for our effort to look for a surface haul route. Okay, now I guarantee you that every presentation you see about Antarctica is going to show you something like this map. Nobody looks at their globe from the bottom up. We all look at it from the top down. When we look at something on the wall, Antarctica may be a white swath across the bottom of the map. Uh, but nobody really looks at it like this. And the idea is to say, okay, look, we got a continent down there at the South Pole and its relation to the other continents surrounding it into the Southern Ocean is like this. But uh, you can go to any Antarctic presentation and see something like that. But I have something very special for you. This is my grandfather's 1918 <laughs> Rand McNally globe. And you're looking at it from the South. Now, we got to study this globe. Uh, now, I'm going to leave this and go over to the, to the uh, drawing here for just a second. This red circle, more or less, circles the continent. This dotted circle here is the Antarctic circle. But look at what we've got here. We've got just a little bit of land here, the pink shapes of land. Can anybody see what that word says? Can anybody read that word? Unexplored. Isn't that wonderful? Gosh. 1918. 
if you had a Rand McNally globe in 1918, this is what it looked like to you, an archipelago of islands surrounding the Antarctic Ocean. There's no continent indicated there. Wow, that wasn't 100 years ago. Okay, I'm going to show you a couple more views of the continent of Antarctica to show you where we went. So this is a satellite radar image of the surface of Antarctica intended to show relief via relief features via the, the, the radar. Um, I'm going to lay this over and spin the continent around to show you a, f a few different uh, views in some of the physiographic provinces here. Oh, I will point out before I lay the map over um, three general regions of Antarctica. We are talking about the polar plateau, very high ground here. Uh, South Pole itself is right in here. It's 9,300 feet above sea level, top 9,000 feet of ice. Uh, the Transantarctic Mountains, just like the Front Range, bisecting the continent. And then West Antarctica, considerably lower, maybe average elevation about 4,000 feet. Okay, lay it over. Okay, South Pole Traverse Proof of Concept. Project, heavy cargo hull route from McMurdo on Ross Island, not really the coast, but might as well be. Across the Ross Ice Shelf, that's 640 miles across the Ross Ice Shelf. And in 640 miles, this is an ice shelf that's as big as France, or Texas if you like, um, <laughs> but it is. In the first 640 miles, we gained only four 100 feet in elevation, from sea level to 400 feet. That's a floating ice sheet. That's not, that's not frozen seawater. That's an ice sheet, a glacial ice, formed on the continent that has flowed out to sea. How deep is it? It's about 100 feet thick at McMurdo, up close to the continent. It's about two to 3,000 feet thick. So it's, 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 an, it's officially thick. Okay. All right. So now, um, now we've got to cross over the Transantarctic Mountains. In the next 70 miles, we gain 7,000 feet in elevation. So suddenly you're, you're climbing. Um, this shows the, skeleton, the location of the Skelton Glacier, which Sir Edmund Hillary took with a tractor in uh, 1957 or 8. This shows the Beardmore Glacier, which Robert Falcon Scott in 1911 and 12 took to a, a ascend to the polar plateau and get onto the South Pole. Shackleton, three years before him in 1909, also went up the Beardmore Glacier. He didn't quite get to pole, though. And here is the Axel Heiberg Glacier where Roald Amundsen uh, took, uh, in 19, took him up the Transantarctics in 1911. And he's the one that was the first to actually reach the South Pole. We're going over the Leverett Glacier. Nobody's been there before. And uh, I like to spin this one around. So here we topped over the, the Transantarctics. We've come through the pass at the Leverett Glacier and on to South Pole. Pretty neat pictures. And of course, the key feature for our effort was to go back to McMurdo. It doesn't do just to go to South Pole. You've got to show that you can do this over and over again by going back and forth, back and forth, hauling new gear there, hauling waste gear back out. Now, what's at stake? Um, the opening chapter of my book, it's, and it's the only chapter told in third person, tells you about how Linda came to be in this predicament in 1990. We could not stand this. We have to do this safely. We have to raise the bar to a very high safety standard. We can't afford loss of equipment, loss of life, injury to people. This has to be done safely. In 1990, Linda was out crossing the shear zone. This is a belt of crevasses about 25 miles out of McMurdo. It's perfectly smooth looking ground, but this, at the time, this 65,000 pound D8 Caterpillar driving across the crevasse bridge, didn't know it was there, uh, collapsed the crevasse bridge, and down Linda went into the crevasse. So from this point of view, you're actually looking down the crevasse 
straight down at Linda, total distance, uh, not doesn't quite show in this, but 60 feet down. Down she went, straight down. She was hauling a 20-ton sled load with 30,000 pounds of dynamite on it. The sled didn't follow Linda into the crevasse. Rather, when Linda dropped down into the crevasse, the sled jammed across the, the span of the crevasse on the surface and bridged it. Thankfully, the, the two who were on board here, they did survive. Um, but the dynamite didn't come in after them. We can't stand anything like that. Uh, so we went out to the same shear zone and set up our camp for the first year. Now this, let me tell you what the shear zone is. It's a belt of crevasses. The belt is about 70 miles long. It originates off a point of land, a peninsula of Antarctica called Minna Bluff and terminates on the, the uh, eastern side of Ross Island at Cape Crozier. So it's about 70 miles long. We cross this belt of crevasses at a narrow, at a narrow spot, and that's about, about where it was, the belt was three miles wide. So what's happening here is the Ross Ice Shelf is flowing this way, the McMurdo Ice Shelf is flowing this way. At the interface between the two of them, you get this great shearing action right at the contact, and that's what makes the crevasses. So we went out in that first year, set up camp, that was our camp, and every day we went out into the shear zone uh, to look for crevasses and to mitigate the hazard. Uh, this is how we detected crevasses. Uh, when I say crevasse detector, I am not referring to the 10,000 pound piston bully. <laughs> I am referring to a ground penetrating radar antenna mounted in the inner tube at the end of that 20 foot long boom that we cobbled together in McMurdo. The ground penetrating radar antenna looks straight down and as this vehicle is moving forward it tells you what it sees underneath it. Now we, uh, inside the cab are, are two people, the vehicle operator and the radar reader. The radar reader is looking at a computer screen to see what images the signal cable is sending back into the cab. Now we did develop a couple of protocols for this thing that where we figured out how to uh, search effectively for hidden crevasses at a forward speed of three miles an hour. When at three miles an hour forward, when the antenna detected a crevasse and the signal gets back to the radar reader, the radar reader tells the vehicle operator to stop. We showed that we that the antenna we could stop the vehicle and the antenna would overrun what it saw by only five feet. We developed another protocol for seven miles an hour. When we called stop because we saw something, uh, we could stop after overrunning the obstacle by 15 feet. So I'm going to step away again. Uh, at three miles an hour, when we hollered stop, the crevasse would be under here. At seven miles an hour, the crevasse would be under here. <laughs> when we were in the shear zone, in an area of, of known crevasses, uh, we didn't do seven miles an hour. Okay, what does the radar reader see? This is what the radar sees. These are cross sections that appear on the computer screen. As the vehicle travels forward, the image is formed on the right side of those cross sections and scrolls to the left. Now, the vertical dimensions of this cross section are 12 and a half meters, or about 40 feet. At three miles an hour, the horizontal dimension is about 200 feet. In the upper right, what you're seeing is relatively undisturbed snow stratigraphy. Everything that looks like it's horizontal or like horizontal stratigraphy, those are snow layers that the radar is picking up. Um, the one in the upper right shows a big black void in the middle. Well, crevasses are big black voids. And we like it when something looks like a crevasse shows up, because now we know to stop. When we saw images like the one in the lower portion with all those chaotic reflections, we didn't know what those were. We thought maybe we were talking about a crevasse where the bridge had broken and dropped in once upon a time, and we were picking up reflections off of pieces of broken bridge that had collapsed into the void. Well, that's not what we were looking at right there. Now, the next picture I'm going to show you is 
what that image represents. This was a really, really big crevasse. We called this one Mongo. Um, it was aptly named. Uh, it was 120 feet deep, I believe. Uh, at the base of the bridge, it was 25 feet across. The bridge was about 25 feet thick. Um, this was a big one. This, this was really scary. But now, but here's the good news. We found it before it found us. Now, we're in this terrain with all of these crevasses. Now, that's me up there jumping up and down on the bridge trying to see if I can... But the ground that we were searching was just like all that ground behind that hole to the horizon. You don't see the crevasses. They're all bridged over. And any depression is full of drift snow. So we're looking through that kind of smooth, featureless terrain for demons like, like this one. So um, I had to show you what that radar image was. Uh, when we first find a crevasse with, using explosives, we open a small hole in the, in the bridge, and we stick a mountaineer down in there. <laughs> now, we didn't have time to be amateur mountaineers ourselves. I hired real pros. These guys were good. They gave me information that I needed, that our team needed, to deal with this crevasse hazard, such as how deep is the crevasse? What is the span at the base of the bridge? How thick is the bridge? What is the condition of the underside of the bridge? Is it broken and blocky? Does it look like it's going to fall in, or, or what is that? What does the crevasse look like to the right? What does it look like to the left? And then we'd haul them out, they'd make their report, and we'd go on to the next thing. We'd make a, a bigger hole in it. Um, and once we got a bigger hole, then with the bridge collapsed, then we'd stuff it full of snow. Now. The bridge is gone. You have a void. Pieces of the bridge are down inside the crevasse. Uh, but now we're going to put a plug of snow where the void used to be. Finding snow in Antarctica is not a difficult proposition. <laughs> but finding snow in a field full of deadly hidden crevasses that you can safely maneuver up to the brink and deliver it, that is difficult. But Nevertheless, we do it. And once we do it, we drive across the plug, and we go looking for the next crevasse. In that first year, we crossed the, the shear zone, the three-mile-long crossing. Uh, we encountered 32 hidden crevasses and mitigated them all by means that I've just told you about. That's our tent camp down at the far end of the road, and this post right here is the very end of the shear zone. Once we had crossed the shear zone, well, the Ross Ice Shelf was open for business. And we raised the American flag belonging to Silverton American Legion Post 14 <laughs> in triumph and celebration. And then, since we had finished this job a little bit earlier, uh, we went back to McMurdo and, and got a speedy tractor and a, a quick sled and went out across the shear zone again to see what we could find out on the Ross Ice Shelf. We proved another 100 miles to a point that we called south before we turned around and went back uh, to McMurdo and ultimately back home to Colorado. So that's the first year. Next year, we got to get a whole bunch of tractors. This is a schematic of the stuff that we had to procure. The procurement action was underway actually during the first year while we were working in the shear zone. Um, lots of different kind of tractors. The, the, you recognize the radar prospecting vehicle on top, the box-shaped thing uh, down below that is the one that we called the Elephant Man. Um, not because it was ugly. It was ugly, but because when you're riding in that box, it's like riding on a howdah on an elephant's back. So it's back and forth and back and forth. Uh, the D8 Bulldozer, uh, Case Quad Track, and a Caterpillar Challenger Tractor, uh, all but the, the D8 have rubber, continuous rubber belted tracks. They're not s segmented steel like the D8 is. Everything on there that looks like a gray tank-like thing is a tank carrying fuel. The two red trailers behind the D8, the first one is our, our galley and our berthing module. And the second one is our power generation station, ablutions, and a fuel, fueling station. Uh, miscellaneous other sleds. But now, it's easier to comprehend that in schematic, but now this is what it, what it looked like. 
uh, Elephant Man down in the in the lower um, lower left. So anyway, that's that's what that stuff looks like in real life. Now we got out past uh, Point South and discovered something that nobody knew was there. We discovered a snow swamp, a region of excessively soft snow. The alpinists and uh, snow scientists in these regions generally refer to it as temperature gradient snow. They used to refer to it as depth ore. We got into stuff that was like 10 feet deep with this. And it grainy stuff, no inner granular stickum. You know, it's just bleh. It's like little marbles or ball bearings. That, so we wind up trying to slog through that. We're dragging by the axles. Well, I call it an axle. Um, you'll see it, this white piece right here. You'll see how we, how we change that. But anyway, uh, that, was, that was just miserable slog across the, the snow swamp. Nobody knew it was there. Uh, we stuck a lot of tractors. We got very good at rescuing stuck tractors. Um, this is an important uh, picture. It, it's, uh, what we found is that when we traveled with our tractors around in a circle and the sled train behind it, the skis came up out of the tractor tracks and rode just inside the circle into virgin, untracked snow, that the towing resistance uh, w was much less. Uh, we could pull them easier as long as the, as long as the skis weren't plowing into the churned up snow that the uh, tractors had left behind. But how, we can't go to South Pole going in spirals or circles like that all the time. We had to come up with something else. But could we prove what we did? Here's a test that we conducted that proved what we had to do to, to improve our mobility. There is a four steel tank sled train off picture, but that's at the point of the V. Uh, with these two straps and these two tractors, both tractors moving forward pulled that train uh, between the tractors. That was the first step. Could we do it effectively? The next step was to actually put a load cell at the point of that V and measure the towing resistance. What we found was that the towing resistance of the sled train when they were not running in the tractor tracks was exactly half, 50% of the towing resistance when the sled skis were aligned with the tractor tracks. Now that's kind of counterintuitive. There's all the truck trailers you see on the traffic, on the highways here, the wheels on the trailers are gauged exactly the same as the tractor wheels that are, and you think about that when you're shooshing in the cross country snow and you, you make a trail, it hardens, but this, this snow is so cold and so grainy, couldn't do that and that's where we got the problem. Anyway, um, we saw what we had to do. We had quantifiable information uh, that says we got to get the sled skis out of the tractor tracks. We got disappointing performance at a point called RIS-1. We didn't even get across the Ross Ice Shelf. We had hoped to get up to that point called L00, but we didn't make it. We didn't make it. We were whipped. Uh, so the next year, uh, Planning for improvements, this is year three. I showed you the white bench on that one sled. We now have these red benches here and they're six feet longer than the white bench. So they're holding skis way outside of the tractor tracks. We changed the shape of the leading edge of the skis. All the skis in Canada, in, in Northwest Territories, in the Yukon, and uh, in uh, the Alaskan Arctic, follow this radius curve uh, such as you're seeing in the, in, in the left-hand picture. We changed that to a quarter uh, uh, elliptical curve to lower that angle of attack. Worked like a champ. Uh, some sleds were not amenable to putting in longer benches, so we made a new sled that was a spreader bar sled. And we, w this, is, this is our spreader bar sled, and we had two whole trains spread off to the, to the side of the tractor tracks. And if you look in the foreground, you can see where the tractor tracks are. They run right in between those two sleds. So those were our, our solutions. And uh, we made it to our previous year as far the south, which was at RIS-1JW. Everything we did to improve our mobility worked. We had no breakdowns, no, no issues at all. 
Uh, what we did find as we got past our farthest south was another shear zone full of crevasses. Geez, we knew that we expected that there might be crevasses up in this region, but we, we didn't know exactly where they were. This held us up for a month. If we saw 10 crevasses per mile at the shear zone near McMurdo, here we were seeing 20 and 30 crevasses per mile. It was, and we're, we're like blind men searching our way through this area. Now, we, there wasn't enough time, there wasn't enough explosives on the continent to go straight across and deal with everyone that you came to. We had to find a way around or through them. It took us a month, but we did. We found a breach in the, in the shoals, and, and, uh, and we did. And on Christmas Day, uh, we find ourselves on the backside of that, of that um, uh, crevasse field and looking for the first time at the Transantarctic Mountains in front of us. Now, there's a lot going on in this picture, and I'd like to point out a few features of interest to you. This is the first time we saw the Transantarctics up close. The Leverett Glacier, our chosen glacier, is up that away somewhere. Um, note the circular track around the encampment. Uh, that became our practice for safety uh, when we got to the designated distance point for setting up our camp that day. The radar prospecting vehicle, who would always be out in front, swept a circular area around that camp. We called it the camp circle. If he found no crevasses in that circle, we considered it safe, and then the fleet would move into the circle and set up their camp. Um, the other interesting thing here is you'll note that this is an oblique aerial photograph. We didn't have an airplane. Actually, we did. The pilot to this is standing right there. John Penny, the mechanic, he had, uh, he had a, a remote controlled model airplane. <laughs> On a calm day, he would fly it, you know, like a six foot wingspan. He got a very lightweight digital camera and planted it right there up against the fuselage where the wing comes through and he'd fly it and bank it and tell it to take a picture. And it, about one out of 10 pictures came out pretty interesting. <laughs> But it was always fun for us to look down and see. It's like a farmer who's so proud of his rows of corn, just so nice and straight. When you look back at our road behind us here, now not that curve, but you say, look at that straight road we got going across. That's good, good road. OK, on we go, up into the Leverett Glacier. Now, we're into the Transantarctic Mountains. Aren't they beautiful? The Leverett Glacier is in the foreground of this picture, and it is flowing from left to right as you're looking at it. This is Mount Gould. It's just off to the side of the Leverett Glacier, but pretty. You see any mountains like that around here? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, moving on up the Leverett Glacier, this stony prominence is Mount Beasley. Uh, to the left of Mount Beasley in the distance, you see a, a flattish plateau type surface. That is the edge of the polar plateau. That's where we're going. We've got to go up that. Farther up past Mount Beasley now, uh, we're, we're seeing ice falls big as Niagara, seracs, gigantic blocks of ice, uh, ice falls. And in this one, in the ground at the foot of those ice falls, you can actually see the crevasses for the first time. Do you all see them, the gashes, the whitish looking gashes? OK, up we go, up the head wall, up the polar plateau, up, 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 a little bit more, over the top, and there we are. And there's the pilot again, uh, flying his plane. We established our foothold on the polar plateau. Now, because it had taken us a month to find our way through that crevasse field down at the bottom, we burned up more fuel than we had allotted to give a, get us to South Pole and back. We stayed here and said to the National Science Foundation, this is, if we'll finish this job this year. This is the third year of a three-year program. We'll finish it. If you can get us some more fuel at South Pole, and to encourage you to do that, we'll leave that $500,000 D8 bulldozer at South Pole as a prize. That might be persuasive to give us some fuel. Nothing doing. This is the end of a three-year project. 
Why? Raise the flag at the new farthest south. And that's not, that's the official picture. The unofficial one has middle fingers raised. <laughs> uh, so that's as far as we got. Um, and so was there going to be a fourth year or not? Well, there were a lot of people in National Science Foundation that actually were looking for us to fail. They wanted to continue with the airlift. It's more expensive, but proven. But there were a few that were on our side. Uh, when we came down from the Leverett Glacier, I left that bulldozer at the base of the glacier. It was a little known feature of my operations report, or my concept of operations report uh, for this particular year. But it was in there nevertheless. I said, I want to leave the bulldozer there because anticipating that we have future cargo traverses, this workhorse can help us carry big loads up the Leverett Glacier where we, it can release us there and then we can carry the loads across the plateau to pull. So I was going to leave that there. Now this is a slow moving fuel hog, about three, three and a half um, miles to a gallon for this thing and um, slow, slow, jeez. Um, so I left it there. And what you're seeing right there is uh, how we found it the next year when we did win our fourth. But the word was, we want you to run two traverses this next year. If you want a fourth year, you've got to run two traverses, and you've got to deliver as much cargo as you can. So everything became cargo now. Now this D8 bulldozer became cargo. To dismantle that in McMurdo and fly it to South Pole would have consumed four LC-130 cargo flights. Not to mention the labor of tearing it down, loading it up, and then offloading it at pole, and then rebuilding it there. But that, w that became four. Now it happens on this one that I waited until 150 miles farther north on the way back to McMurdo before I radioed in, in fact, that I had followed the operations plan and left the bulldozer. 150 miles farther north, and another day or two for them to get stirred up would add another hundred miles for me. At that point, I would have been so far north of the bulldozer that even I wouldn't have had enough fuel to go back and get it that season if they saw. So that bulldozer is there. And you think anybody's going to uh, leave a $500,000 bulldozer at the base of the lever? Mm. Well, that was leverage. That was leverage, is what that was. <laughs> Everything became cargo. But I managed a plan that showed that we could make more cargo delivery, uh, offset more flights with one traverse than we could with two. And it was twisted, I mean, it's a difficult concept to get your hand around. But as long as we were delivering tractors, we could do it. Uh, this was a tractor in South Pole, I mean at McMurdo, scheduled to be dismantled and flown to South Pole. Um, this would have taken three. LC-130, Hercules flights. I said, look, I'll drive it. I'll drive it for you. This belly dump snow trailer uh, was going to go to South Pole. Another three cargo flights. I said, I'll drag it. I'll drag it to Pole for you. Uh, what had happened at, at South Pole is that big piles of snow that they clean out of the drift every year build up in a big pile and a bulldozer slowly inches it forward down, downwind. The carry distance now for those big piles of snow was about a half mile. Uh, it's w way too much for the bulldozer, so they were going to try this belly dump trailer and see if they could, could haul the snow out. And it, it worked. It worked. Um, here's another sled load of cargo for South Pole. Uh, that was another flight, and uh, we're about ready to go. Here we are in McMurdo. Uh, all of that stuff we're going to take to South Pole as cargo, uh, totaling 11 flights. We also knew we needed more fuel. We did not have the money to buy more fuel tanks, so we came up with a, this solution. Uh, commercially available fuel bladders used by the U.S. military, typically uh, placed on flatbed trucks, this time placed on ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene uh, plastic sheets. That stuff is so slick, you can't even get paint to stick on it. No kidding. 
In fact, if you took off too fast, you pull the sleds right out from under the bladders. That's the reason for all of that lashing is to try and keep the, the bladders on the sled. One of those is, is 20 feet long and 2,000 gallons, 8 feet wide. Um, same for the other one. So there's 4,000 extra gallons of fuel. Um, that expedient solution turns out to be the solution in use today as the traverse capability has evolved to deliver South Pole Station's entire annual fuel supply through bladder sleds like that. Pretty neat stuff. Oh, that's an auspicious time and date. <laughs> the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. The war with Germany is over. Armistice Day. Okay, there we are lined up and ready to go. Uh, five minutes after we take off and round the corner, we're staring directly into the face of a gray blizzard wall overtaking the ice shelf. But we could keep going. We had flags planted every quarter of a mile down the route. If we could see a flag, we could go. And we knew that the route was safe because we'd been over it with radar. This kind of weather grounded the LC-130 Hercules. The traverse kept going. We had 300 miles of unexplored, unproven terrain yet to go to South Pole. Significant events that happened. On November 18, 2005, we were overtaken in mid-stride on the Ross Ice Shelf by a Ken Bork Air Twin Otter. A man gets off and delivers me a disk of declassified information from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. We had worked a cooperative project, project with them where they wanted to see if their orbiting national assets I should say our orbiting national assets, could look down through the surface of the snow and find hidden crevasses. I happen to know where there were some hidden crevasses. I knew precisely where they were. So we conducted a test involving their eyes in the sky against our ground truth. And when that proved to be so wonderfully successful, I said, guys, can you take a look at something else for me? And this is what was being delivered here. That breach that we found in the shoals uh, the crevasse shoals the year before, all I knew about it was about a hundred foot width of it. I said, I need to see more of that. I need to see what's outside of, of my comfort zone there. And that information, uh, they, they got to us. Uh, bladder sleds are working fine, but the, you know what? The poles tractor broke down. Um, that's the one that we we're going to drive to pole instead. Um, geez, so we transfer the fuel out of the bladder into the now emptied capacity of the steel tanks. And we put the broken tractor back on the UHMW <laughs> and hauled it all the way to South Pole. We got to the bulldozer at the base of the Leverett Glacier. Um, you can see every orifice that was open there was, was taped up and, and sealed off, but you can't keep the snow out of the engine compartment. We built a tent over the, over the bulldozer applied heat to the engine compartment, had it all melted out in a day, and that bulldozer was up and running at the end of the day. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, farther up the Leverett Glacier, the Case Quadrac loses a bearing. We're uh, effecting repairs to it. Uh, here's a rare day when the sun is out and there's no wind blowing and the guy's wearing a t-shirt. What is the temperature there? On that day? Well, it's below freezing. I, I, but it, it wasn't uh, prohibitively cold, obviously. Um, it, you're getting a lot of solar gain from this, and it, oh man, you like it. Um, so anyway, we decided we'd have to leave that tractor on the Leverett Glacier, arrange for parts to be flown from the United States to McMurdo and on to South Pole, and if we got to South Pole, we'd pick up the parts and affect the repairs on the way back. Um, the red circles and shapes outline where most of the crevasse hazards were. The two bold ones up at the top uh, are the, uh, represent locations of crevasse hazards that we hadn't dealt with yet. So we, just because we're on the plateau doesn't mean we're out of crevasse hazards, but we happened to, we got so lucky. We went right through them without having to stop. We never even saw a crevasse with our radar. But there were maps that showed there were crevasses in the area, but we just plotted our course well. We, once we got into the plateau, uh, 
we found this region of something called Zestrugi. Now, Zestrugi is, is not an Italian dish. Sophia Loren is an Italian dish. <laughs> a Zestrugi is an erosional remnant of very hard, very hard snow. These are not depositional features. They're rough. In places, they are so hard that even the cleats, the grousers on the D8 would not leave a mark on them. If you wanted to dig a hole, sometimes you'd bend the shovel. If you wanted to plant a flag, you had to auger it. Auger a hole first and then put the flag in it. And for a dual track tractor like that, going over that rough ground, that's a rough ride. The Zestrugis rattled our bones, broke our equipment. It was a long time before we got through what we came to call the Zestrugi National Park. It was about 150 miles long. And of course, as soon as we got out of the Zestrugi National Park, we said, finally, no more Zestrugis. Yeah, right. Um, this is a 10-foot tall bamboo pole, about an inch and a quarter in diameter. Uh, you all know about snow penetrometers where you're gauging the unconfined compressive strength of, of snow. Bang. One hand <laughs> goes down. Watch it again. One hand. That's soft snow. Now, fortunately, we were broadcasting our weight over most of that stuff so we could amble on it, but as soon as we started stirring it up with tractors and such, then, then we, we get stuck again. Yep, so we got another snow swamp. The plateau swamp, how do you get through a snow swamp? This is something I never thought I'd see. The bulldozer is pulling its sleds, that's about a 120,000 pound aggregate in the gross weight of the train. He's pulling it with a winch. When the bulldozer starts to dig in to the snow, he pays out cable on the winch and leaves the sled load behind crawls up out of the snow, and then he winches the sled load forward again. So he's inchworming his way across the polar plateau. When that doesn't work, you got to get the case quad track and get him in the line. So here are now two tractors. You wind up doing a lot of shuttling. Uh, that's me in, the, in this tractor, and I'm pulling the, the pole tractor. But what's the story about shuttling? <laughs> you know, you pack half your load a mile. Then you go back, you get the other half of the load, and bring it up. For one mile made good, you've covered that distance three times. That's at a tremendous cost in fuel and spent emotions. But that's how you get across this until you get a road built. Maybe my favorite picture of all time. Now this one, um, was t this shot was taken by a, a British Antarctic survey, Twin Otter, that came out when we were within 13 miles of South Pole. We had already patrolled this with our radar the day before we are going into pole. I said, look, Stretch, I'm going to build you a road all the way to pole. I'm not going to have you limping, inchworming your way into South Pole with that bulldozer. So we built a road. We built, and we called it a road. When Stretch was going down, he was inchworming at about two miles an hour. When he got on this stuff, he was making about three and a half. Good for him. Uh, the, at the end of that straight shot, you see right on the horizon some darkish buildings. That's the South Pole Station on the horizon. On December 23rd, 2005, we stood for the picture. There's our tractors, and I want to point out a feature here to you. This, this is the pole. Is the pole. At South Pole. At South Pole. <laughs> on January 1st On January of year, 1st of each year, Coast and Geodetic Survey, Coast and Geodetic comes, Geodetic out survey and comes out and relocates South Pole. This is the Pole Monument at 90 degrees south from January the year before. The ice that carries the Pole Monument moves about 30 feet a year, so that's why they reposition the Pole Monument. But that's it. That's the South Pole. Pretty neat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You, know, you, you look down and, gosh, you get dizzy, you know, the <laughs> vertigo. All right, what did we do? In the proof of concept traverse, we offset 11 flights. That's a big hit. That's a, that's a big deal. That's, that's a good hit. That's, that's really out of the park for, for the first time. Uh, these days, they're getting about 40 to 50 flights offset with two traverses. But that, that was the very first one. Uh, boy, I don't know how much the flight costs. 
uh, it uses twice as much fuel as the Traverse to deliver the same pound of payload. All right, cut to the end of the story. We got back to McMurdo on January 14, 2006, and the concept was clear. Now these are, are halos and doors that you typically see in the, in the Antarctic atmosphere. What does this mean for science support? And this goes to the question that we were just being raised. Now first of all, for science support, we figured that with two traverse fleets developing to maturity, that we could give 90 flights to South Pole back to, to deep field science. Whether they were used for deep field science or not, that's somebody else's decision. But we're, we're, we're relieving South Pole of its dependency on, on those 90 flights. So that's, that's a good hit. Other things for science. Once we built this road out there, now scientists say, hey, we got a road that takes me out to a place I want to, near where I want to be. So we're actually staging science field projects by the Traverse rather than by air rail. That's also pretty cool. Um, what does this mean for the U.S. taxpayer? It's cheaper. Uh, the, as I mentioned, for each pound delivered to South Pole, the Traverse burns half the fuel as the LC-130 to deliver that same pound. That's pretty good. Fuel's pretty expensive. It's about 14 bucks a gallon when you get it at South Pole, and we have it delivered on ships, tanker ships, that offload about 11 million gallons a year. So anyway, that's a, quite a fuel savings. Uh, the environment is a big winner here, a real big winner. The modern Tier 3 tractor engines burn so clean that their exhaust emissions emit merely hundreds, I'm talking about one over 100 part of the noxious emissions that come out of an LC-130 turboprop. You know, the cleanest air ever recorded in the United States, recorded by NOAA, uh, was right after 9-11 when all the airplanes were grounded. Mm -hmm. And you see it, you see it there. When, the man, when, those, when those honkers start taking off over the snow, you see the black particulates all over the place. So this was a big win for, for everybody. Now there, there's this really good book <laughs> <laughs> about this. Now I've, I've given you a lot, of, a lot of pictures to help you visualize some things that you're going to see. There, there's pictures in the book too, but this, mm -hmm. this is a little bit more. Um, and, and maybe this presentation has tended to be uh, a, a little maybe more on the technical side, the story's not like that at all. I want to, with your permission, I want to read just kind of a, an excerpt that will give you the flavor of how this, this book reads. Um, and, and I'll read more if you want, and then I'll open it up for questions. But there's really only one chapter, the Linda chapter, that's told in third person. Everything else is first person narrative, nonfiction. And I think that I want to read Yes. Um, we're starting out on this year four. We've just left McMurdo. We're going out that first 25 miles to the shear zone, and we're going to set up camp there before we, we move on with the next day. So we're in this blizzard wall that, I'm, that I showed you. Um, I'm thinking back to our morning meetings in the McMurdo Galley. Uh, we were, we had briefings every morning. We were required to have them for safety, but they were a good idea. Anyway, it gave everybody their plan for the day. And, and, uh, so anyway, we're in, we're all in our tractors going south now, and I'm just thinking. I put Judy in the Elephant Man this year deliberately. She'd be running the Elephant Man back from our farthest south. If that happened to be the South Pole, she'd be hauling back uh, one or more passengers. Because of the calming effect Judy had on us, we were nicer to each other. <laughs> Her presence in that outsized cab would dampen the grumbling, the grumbling that could infect the group when some rode as idle, idle passengers. To hedge my bets, though, one morning two weeks ago at our breakfast table back in McMurdo, I called the meeting to order. We will have only one cynic this year. <laughs> it was pretty easy to read everyone's face. 
What the hell is he rattling on about now? Any cynicism shown by anyone else will not be allowed. I spoke sternly. Captain Philippa, a young captain of the U.S. Marines. Yes, sir. Captain Philippa, you are our designated cynic. Uh -huh. Greg's eyes widened before he could say, but, 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 I continued, this is an important job. We can't every one of us be cynics, but every group needs one good one. So long as he's on our side, we didn't have any good cynics last year. A good cynic is invaluable. He's the one that catches us in the middle of some harebrained idea we're about to go <coughs> off on and reminds us, what makes you think you can get that part in time? You'll do this job for all of us. Greg fought to keep the corners of his mouth from curling. How I kept a straight face, I'll never know. From time to time, I'll call on our designated cynic for his input. Do we all understand? The group returned bewildered nods all around. Okay, the team cynic is Captain Philippa. After we broke up, Greg approached me, rising from the table. Boss, I, I don't think I can do this job very well. I'm more of a positive, straight-ahead guy, he said, seriously concerned. You mean you can't do that job, Marine? <laughs> no, no, sir, I don't mean that. I just think somebody else would do a better job for you. The galley was completely empty now, but for him and me. Greg, look. I had a bunch of real sour pusses last year when we came back. Any of us, including me, might make a mistake or get confused. We lost all humor about it. I don't want that to happen again this year. It's better to laugh by officially designating you as cynic. You, who are nothing if not positive and straight ahead, then I've officially said no one else can have that job. Now, can you do that job for me or not? Greg looked at me sideways. Oh, I'll try. It'll take practice. <laughs> but don't worry about that. You've already done most of it by innocently just sitting there. When I need the cynic, you'll know it. It'll be when somebody else tries to take your job away from you. <laughs> I'll need you to step up and reclaim it. That conversation was two weeks old. But I thought about those things once I was alone in my cab, Judy and Greg, and keeping the crew's spirits in good shape. Now, there did come a time when Greg performed his job as cynic admirably. But you'll have to read about it. I don't <laughs> um, I'm happy to answer any questions for you. If you yes, sir. Do you have the the technical stuff in the book too? Yes. It's all in there? Okay. Yes, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's not weighted with technical stuff, but you want to find out, it's about the same level as I described it here with okay. it, but, but there's far more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sir. Um, what's the concern with uh, the moving ice sheets in terms of like the, the bridges you built within the crevasses? Mm -hmm. Is the path going to have to be rebuilt every so often? Can I show you another picture? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to scroll through a couple here. Oh, that's, uh, <coughs> that's the traverse this year. The bladders, fuel bladders have become black for solar gain. Anyway, American Legion Post 14, that's the shear zone. I got a, there's a section here where I'm, okay, monuments mark the way. And this is the path through the shear zone, through the crevasse field. Uh, crevasses are marked by two by four posts that are scribed with the name of that crevasse. <coughs> uh, green flags on the left side going out say the safe passage is 20 feet to the right of those green flags. Every year we go in and survey those flags and those posts to see how, to see where they are now. Is you can't navigate that road with GPS. You can't. You can't not do it. I mean, you, you go to a post that you plant here, and you capture its position, you say, this is where it is. That's where it is today. You come back a year later, it might be a half mile away. So you can't navigate. You have to go flag to flag. 
And, but the GPS helps us monitor the deformation of the road. And yes, this road was perfectly straight when we finished it uh, that first year. The fourth year it was curvy. Um, we survey those crossings every year because those are ultimately dangerous places where new crevasses form, old ones dilate and uh, break off from their fill plugs. We got to go inspect those crossings and restore them every year. And what does that look like? Oh, yeah, why do flags mark the way? Because sometimes you get in a whiteout and you, you lose all your horizon definition. You can't even see a shadow. You can't see your own shadow. Monuments mark the way. That's crossing the shear zone. That's stretched, taking the position of a monument. Here's an example of monument movement. This is one uh, south. Uh, so you re record the date of occupation, uh, you record its position, um, and then you figure the elapsed days uh, between occupations and the distance moved, the uh, direction moved, and the rate of movement per day. Now this isn't in the book, uh, but that's what that looks like, the distance moved. Uh, you know, pretty, pretty neat formulas. Yeah, right. These are Habersheim formulas. Uh, the direction is moved is even more impressive. <laughs> but the rate of movement in terms of feet per day, simple. Look at that, 6.4 feet a day. That's a half a mile a year. Was there another question? Yes, ma'am. I have two. Okay. Who funds your projects? None of us is in the hero business, and this is an important point to make. This story is not a hero story. This is not a survival story. This is about accomplishing the mission. The older heroes truly did have to cultivate the hero business. That's how they got their patronage. We were ordinary working stiffs, pulling off a pretty extraordinary job, but we were propelled by the awesome power of the United States taxpayer, and we knew it. This is all our project. I, I trust you. I feel pretty strongly about that. This is, this is, a, this is a, a, a great thing that we've, that we've done for the program. Uh, we have revolutionized the way logistics are handled in Antarctica. Uh, cost savings to the taxpayer, and this is all ours. So when you read about this story, read yourself into it. I have one other question. Yes, ma'am. Is that actually like a continent owned by somebody, or is it a landmass, or is it a I shelf? I mean, it's so bizarre to me that I think mo most people in this audience would don't even understand what Antarctica is exactly. Number one, it is a continent. Uh, another part of your question was who owns it? Several countries made a territorial claim in Antarctica. But the Antarctic Treaty that evolved after the international... I'm so glad you said this. <laughs> the Antarctic Treaty that evolved after the International Geophysical Year, uh, right around the 1960, 61, 62, uh, involved uh, about 17 different signatories, people that had participated, nations that had participated <clears throat> in the International Geophysical Year. And that treaty, set aside all territorial claims. It just said, look, we are all interested in this place, and these are the rules by which we'll get along. Sweet. Yeah, it's, it's even sweeter than that. Um, the United States and Russia had, were, were the biggest players on, on, the, on the block, biggest kids on the block. When we signed the treaty, we said, not only do we not make a territorial claim, we don't recognize anybody else's territorial claim. In fact, the treaty writes that off and says, for as long as this treaty exists, nothing that any of the signatories can do can either enhance or detract from any claim that they might have made. We just set it aside. And here's the other neat thing. The treaty provides rights of inspection. There you go. Everywhere, everywhere. You want to go see the Russian camp? Uh, you, you go see. 
um, it's just <coughs> unlimited rights of inspection. So it's, it's all, and it's really a remarkable document. I urge you to, to look it up on, on Google or Wikipedia or something. I will. The well, Antarctic. Thank you for your candor. Yeah, sure. <laughs> now you had a question. Yeah, I, wanted, I was just curious how the team was composed and, and sort of selected. I mean, not by name, but like, who, you, who did you need to do this? Um, I finally hit the right combination in the last year. <laughs> um, initially, I hired several mountaineers to rotate through the shear zone work because I had a long-term interest in getting them used to how we dealt with crevasses. Um, I, know, I knew that I needed at least two mechanics. I needed skilled heavy equipment operators. I needed skilled blasters. And I needed skilled emergency medical people. Now, our final crew was only eight. Some of the people filled not only their role as a bulldozer operator, but also as a amateur mountaineer, or a mechanic who was also a paramedic. So we had to, had to mix all of these together. Um, but how did I determine them? I picked them mainly for their years of Antarctic experience. Um, and I, uh, crew compatibility was a, was a real big thing. And as you read through the story, you'll see, I wonder what happened to that guy. I'm not going to tell you what happened. You just didn't come back. <laughs> Was there another question? In the back. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm fascinated with the psychological aspects of this, because if I had to be on that plateau for four years, I'd probably go crazy. <coughs> Did anyone crack or, I mean, obviously you were motivated, but were there psychological strains or, and obviously i got to read the book, but. Um, First, I want to report that in all of this proof of concept project, <clears throat> nobody got killed, nobody even got hurt, and there was no loss of equipment. The monotony of crossing the plateau really got to stretch at one point. Um, I, I thought he was crazed, nearly mad, um, but we fixed it, and you'll read about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? Knowing what you know now after all these years, um, if you were to hire crews again, what personality traits would you be looking for? Uh, the personality traits could be quite varied, but the main thing is what are the inner personal traits. I mean, do they get along with somebody else? It doesn't matter if, if this particular personality is noisy and obnoxious, so long as that noise and obnoxiousness mixes well with, with the rest of the group. Saying, so, you know, that's just, that's just Scooter, you know, something like that. Um, I, I suppose I immediately eliminate anybody that's a liar. Just, you, you have to be just completely honest with yourself and with, with others. Um, but we had a great mix of guys and gals on the, on the, the crew, and you'll, you'll see how that evolves. Sir. Um, you had a, a limited amount of time during each trip up there. The people that were on the trip, did you, did you cycle them in, into, into a 24-hour workday? Uh, no, we worked 12 on, 12 off. Um, and that, that's a very good question. Getting paid for that uh, was, was difficult, but uh, I wasn't going to do it unless, unless we got adequate compensation for that. Um, there's, there's a good portion of the book about that exact subject. But no, we weren't hot bunking. Uh, we felt that the best cycle was uh, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And when we were off, all the engines were off. 
cooked our meals, enjoyed fellowship in the galley. Does that answer your question? It does. Good. Sir? Can you talk a little bit more about the creature discomforts, I guess is probably the right way to put it, uh, and also the communications, the comms that you had yes. to the outside world? First, the creature discomforts. Um, I learned from Fridjof Nansen's book, um, Farthest North, where he sailed the Fram up into the Arctic back. Something from what he said, he says, you want your people to be as comfortable and as secure as they possibly can. And I looked at the design of the Fram and how he set that up for, for his crews in crowded quarters. And I said, I, I began to understand. And then I went to France and talked to Patrice Godon, who was the head of the French Traverse Project. And I said, what do you think? And he says, look, you've got to provide for the comfort of your people. If it's uncomfortable, then they're going to become preoccupied with their own discomfort. And when you become preoccupied with your own discomfort, you're going to lose track of the mission. You're going to make a mistake. You're going to get on other people's nerves. You're liable to make a mistake, which involves injury. And uh, if it's injury to you, it's just as likely to be injury to somebody else. So i got to say, there were no creature discomforts that I know of that were nettlesome. We had incinerating toilets for solid waste. We had showers. Um, we had laundry, a marine uh, cycle laundry. Uh, and that, that was ultimately important because you knew at the end of what might be a long haul hard day that there was a comfortable place to go. Mm -hmm. Now the other part was comms. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Iridium phones by which our mechanics, real time from the Ross Eye Shelf, could contact case dealer service representatives in Greeley, Colorado, <laughs> and discuss a problem. <laughs> that was pretty neat. The Iridium also had data links for email. We had limited email capability through the Iridium network. We had HF and VHF radio. Our inner tractor to tractor was VHF sets, you know, just like elaborate walkie-talkies. Um, for emergencies, we had long wire uh, HF sets, uh, which we never used, but that was a standard issue and everybody's required to carry that. You know, bounce your signal off the ionosphere and back down. And I think that's about it. There we go. Ma'am. So the snow swamp, how did you build a road across that and did it stay put or solid or, you know, from mm -hmm. one time to the next? The, it was a mistake to go out with cargo tractors and cargo sleds uh, and try and build a road with it. We should have built the road first and then traversed it with the, the heavier equipment. But we didn't know. We got into this jam. Now, when you got that kind of snow that's, that's so grainy, doesn't have any inner granules stick them, you got to really pack those grains together to where the, where the grains are touching point to point, the grain centers and becomes uh, uh, bonded with its, its neighboring grain. That's just, that's a pressure metamorphism. It's not a chemical, it's not, uh, uh, it's, you got to really apply pressure, you got to leave it alone, let that centering set up. And once you do that, you're, you're eventually squeezing the air out of it. You don't get anything like a wet snowball, but you're, you eventually build that stronger surface. Now, does it last from year to year? Well, we know it's going to move side to side with the flow of the ice. But you can take a, a Ramson penetrometer and go out where you know the road is because you've got the flag over here and you're 10 feet off the flag, you're in the middle of the road, and drop your Ramson penetrometer into it. It'll fall through maybe this much new snow from the last time, but then it'll go clunk and it'll hit that surface. So your job in this next year is to take the new snow and pack it down against that, that uh, tough strengthened layer that you've been building. So it's just a matter of working it and getting that, that pressure metamorphism to work for you and set up. You could think of it as like concrete setting up, um, up on the polar plateau. That snow road would set up literally overnight, meaning 12 hours, uh, but down on the Ross Ice Shelf, 
uh, that was lower. For some reason, it took maybe five days to seven days for it to, to set up. Is that weight of machinery that does the pressure? Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Uh, I have two questions. Yep. 